My name is Huak Amu. My native name is Huak. Today we're speaking about the voices from our ancestors that have lived in the Columbia River Gorge for over 10,000 years. We will share our history and culture with you through art and the way we uh, work with our young ones today to maintain the voice of our people. They're like the atlatl, and which is a tool that is held beneath the spear that gives it greater velocity and energy to go forward. And this will help us deliver our message to the next seven generations. And, so, and then there's she who watches. Yes. What happened? Oh, I'm pushing the button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's my goo for the day. <laughs> There's the velocity, energy. And Shaglal was the one who lived in the Columbia River Gorge and Coyote changed her into a rock. And uh, she's very special to me because she overlooked the village where my great-great-grandmother lived. This image is so special for people on the river that when they go and visit her, at times, it's, for them, it's like going to church. And this is a, a site where a lot of natives once lived. It's uh, called Salilo Falls, and it's no longer with us today due to damming. But it was once a great place for socializing, fishing, trading, or looking for love. But we oh. call it snagging. <laughs> <laughs> bad, Toma, bad. <laughs> this is the Sililo of old, and salmon was so sacred to us that every year we'd have our first salmon ceremony, and we'd have a salmon feast and celebrate the foods that, that kept us alive for the year, and, um, and we were very grateful to the sacredness of the salmon and our sacred foods. So the boys you see here, are the ones that once lived at the Slilo Falls village. Uh, I believe that their memories still live on through our youth today, even though we have suffered uh, great tragedies along the river from the loss of our falls, uh, boarding schools, and becoming secondary citizens of our own native land. So thank goodness for our elders. Because of them, they continue to teach us the old ways. They teach us how to take care of the salmon, to make the baskets, to put the salmon in, to, to be able to trade it or to store it for the winter. So these are some traditional homes. Uh, on the right is something you, you know of, it's a teepee. But it was brought here, introduced to us through trade from the plains people that would come and barter with us for our fish. And on the other side is a tule mat house. And that's a traditional home for us. What it is, it's a, it's a reed that's been collected in the wetlands, sewn together, and put over a form to insulate us. It's also used for other things from like getting married and to getting buried. And I'm not going to say marry him and bury him. So. <laughs> you just did. I told. <laughs> And so the voices also gave us legends, and uh, which I have made uh, the petroglyphs and the beaded bag designs and made them more beautiful, and shaglal. And uh, it was based on the stick Indians, or stiaha, and they're legendary beings that live in the mountains, and they will guide a good person to safety or a bad person deeper into the forest. And if a child misbehaves, the stick Indian will steal them from beneath their covers at night, never to be seen ever again. <laughs> so I too have heard stories of stick Indians as a kid growing up and similar things <laughs> being stolen by, by creatures on the river. They're also known as little people. And as I got older, I had to paint this image to get these feelings out. And I have a story that goes with it as well, but I 
you know, have kids of my own now, and I scare the hell out of them with the same stories. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, ha I can't scare my customers. They, I need to make a living, and so I, I've been mentored by the greatest artists, I think, in the whole world, and best friends, and they've taught me how to use glass to uh, share the petroglyph images and uh, and they've taught me how to make jewelry, they've taught me how to do everything, and uh, they've just been the best bunch of people in the whole world. So while my, I'm on path as an artist, uh, I created this image here to tell a story of the river and how we fish today. I also use it as a, as a metaphor for people who live in emotional storms. And I feel that, you know, like this picture here, that everything's pretty rough. And I feel a lot of people live in these storms, but you can't live in a storm forever. If you can push through this storm, there are brighter days ahead. Sometimes it's like a door and you have to get kicked through it. Like you do for me? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love honoring my ancestors of all different Indian people in the Pacific Northwest. And, and here we're at the Welcome Gate uh, for the Confluence Project, and we're honoring the Chinook people. And uh, they built dugout canoes and went up and down the Columbia River. These people along the river had, you know, a unique language that made them very successful in this area, which is a mix of English and French and Sahaptan. And come to find out that the main businessmen and chiefs were actually the women. We knew how to cut to the chase. <laughs> and so, and we ran a tight ship, so we made sure our villages had everything while they were out playing with fishing and hunting. <laughs> However, we weren't always successful. This is Salilo Village. First day for the, a job for the Confluence Project, and we went there, and nobody was there. I think, oh my God, what are we going to do? No one's here. And so we went up and down the village, and every time we saw a body move, we'd say, come, come play, come play with us, we're playing in clay, please come. And finally they did, and so. So, <laughs> while working with the kids from Slilo, it gave them the opportunity to get away from their normal routine, maybe from playing video games and surfing the internet. And it gave us the opportunity to engage with them through art and culture and you know, our history as river people. And it, the sense of empowerment that they got just from creating without restrictions and, uh, and then to be able to play freely it was just phenomenal to see the joy in their faces. They made a million stick Indians and coyotes, and they were so happy. Oh, it didn't change. Oh, sorry. So <laughs> after uh, they got all their masks and artwork done, Lillian got them into an art show at the Mary Hill Museum, which was pretty amazing. And, you know, they get to start off their little art career in the museum, and if they decide to seek a higher education in art, this is a great launching point for them. Yep. And while working in these uh, workshops and hanging out with these kids, I would bring in items for them to draw. Uh, I brought in a ram horn ladle, and we sat and talked about them, and a lot of them haven't seen these before, but they are actually, you know, our culture, and it's an old tool that we used to have, but it's something that's fading away, and no one's doing this art form anymore. And if we don't talk about it, then it's something that we lose. And so Toma was their role model. And um, I was getting tired of doing the workshop, so I passed it over to him. And he was the best thing that happened to the village because of his beautiful braids. And uh, <laughs> he was tall, and he spoke softly, and uh, he did things in the proper manner. And they just loved him. And so it was just a major treat to watch him communicate with these young boys, and uh, which most of them were raised in single families by their mothers. <laughs> Make me blush. <laughs> so while working in these workshops, I got to sit with this young man making a tuli mat. And I've never made a tuli mat before, but he got to sit and show me 
how to do it. And I feel that if you're working with them, you know, it's always a two-way street. It's not always what I can bring to them. Like, I can learn a lot from them as well. So it's helping and being helped. And so it's, uh, being a mentor has its good points and bad points. And this is Atwai Marcus. And uh, he was from Warm Springs. And this was for the Native American Youth and Families Association. And we worked together. And he, he was so shy and quiet that, but during the artistic process, it just brought him out of himself and he just had such a great time and he got to dress up, go to the auction and uh, got to see his pieces sell for gobs of money. He was on top of the world for many days but unfortunately a year later he uh, died of a heart problem and uh, this is to honor him. And so while working with our youth we teach them that you need to learn the original styles and everything that's custom to us because it is our culture and it is something that we need to preserve and pass down. Like this boy here, he got to make a mask with a traditional style and then put his own flavor to it. And so put a contemporary flavor to it. And then in the back is a mural that I did, which is a Columbia River style, but more contemporary to today with uh, aerosols and the colors used. So again, it's the atlatl. He's just bringing everything forward and, and yet maintaining the old ways, which is still so very important to us. And being a mentor to Toma, I get to take him to all these wonderful dinners and where people are being awarded. And this is Dr. Rebecca Dobkins, who got a wonderful award. But uh, for us to bestow upon her the best reward we can give is this blanket designed by Toma, and to give a Pendleton blanket is one of the highest honors we can do. You know, I always thought she took me to these dinners because she needed a bodyguard. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, it's carry my stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so on the right is uh, Bridget Scott, and she's another mentor, an amazing person. She's a basket and bead maker and knows a lot about the culture and history. She comes in and shares it. And I think that it's very important to share your gifts and to share whatever you can to our kids because, you know, you're hoarding it. And if you don't share it, then no one gets to learn it. Yep. And she's a wonderful, wonderful person. Her, she was taught by her uncle, great uncle, who was a Wasco chief, and she shares so beautifully. So while working with youth, took me on a trip to uh, Limbe, Haiti, with an artist group and we put together workshops to do murals and to do drawing and we got to be a part of the first mural that went into this community and while working with these kids it taught them to you know be proud of where they're at no matter how bad things can be and they got to learn the techniques to make this mural in their community and then they continued them after we left just as well. The power of art is so powerful. It's just wonderful. And back in the gorge. So, while working with kids in these schools, I've noticed that the first thing that goes in the budget cuts is the art program. They just cut it right out like it doesn't matter. And I got to come in and work with these kids and I seen the artists awake out of a lot of them. And they didn't want to go back to class because they had math or something. We can sit and talk about art all day and do these paintings. And they loved it. And just look at those happy faces in the paintings. They, they get to go where? Oh, they're going around the school. And so they leave their own legacy behind. Yep. And can you imagine the power that gives them every day to go to school? Look at those beautiful colors. And so, well, on my journey as an artist also, I did this piece to commemorate the Slilo Falls. And I wanted people to be able to see it and talk about it. Because if we don't preserve our history, then it's truly gone. And so with this, I have it so people can talk to their kids and talk to everyone about it. Because it's, you know, dwindling fast. Yep. And we, it lets people know that we're still here. We have not been vanished. And, uh, and fishing is very, very dangerous. And... Uh, there were times when somebody would fall in and we would lose a fisher. 
and that's when the chief would ring a bell and they would cease fishing to either look for him or to call fishing a day to honor the lost fishermen. So one of the shackles of the river is these dams. And what they, they've done is taken away quite a bit of our art and history. They've covered over villages and our grave sites and a lot of our art. And today, this is what Salilo Falls looks like. It's a lake. It's still there, but it's out of our reach and it's over a slow, it's under a slow moving water. Maybe in maybe another 500 years, it'll be gone and it'll be free and wild again. Just like you. Um, <laughs> I'm not free. <laughs> and so we are left with fishing sites, fishing access sites, and uh, the government has given us, in lieu of Silalo Falls and, and our land along the Columbia River, um, to fish, it's launch our boats at a certain place, but we were regulated as to when we can go fish and how many fish we can catch and uh, where we can fish. So while working with our youth gives us the opportunity to engage with them and create a positive uh, relationship and it's something that we need to do so our stories can carry on and they can do the art and they can create a positive you know, relationship for the future generations because we're trying to build that for the next seven generations. And so I feel like it's very important for all of us to teach our children how to honor their culture and their history, to give them a sense of place, and to empower them to have some respect for our Earth, our Mother Earth. Thank you. Thank you very much.